Improving Society in less than 30 minutes. The short podcast of Körperstiftung. Fast charging and long-lasting batteries. In a world that is filled with technology, we all want our devices to run smoothly. Thinner, lighter and yet more powerful. I bet you know the ads. I also bet that you might not know the science behind the batteries or who's doing the research. At least I didn't know it before I met the British chemist Claire Gray. She has performed pioneering work to optimize batteries, which is why she's the winner of the Kerber European Science Prize 2021. Let the spark ignite your view on batteries. Improving society with Claire Gray. Moin, or in English, hello. Hi, nice to see you remotely. I'm very honored to have you on the show. And we are talking a lot about batteries and lifespan of batteries today. So obviously the first thing I need to ask you is, why is it that after like two years, all of my smartphones lose their juice? I would turn the question around and say, it's actually amazing they last for so long. <laughs> okay, fair enough. You've got materials and you're putting lithium ions backwards and forwards in them, and you're expecting the structures to stay the same and not to degrade, you are taking an anode and a cathode, so the, the part, major parts of your batteries, and one is highly oxidized and one is highly reduced, and they yet are stable. You have an anode, the negative part, and you have mm -hmm. a liquid, and that liquid actually reacts with the anode all the time. And yet it's the whole passivation chemistry that the chemists and scientists have figured out that is keeping these things for going for two years. So I actually think you should turn it around and say, wow, I've got something that goes backwards and forwards. You know, how many processes in your life do you expect to happen 500 times without you making a mistake? You know, even mm. if you open the cupboard and you start putting things in shelves, you'll mess it up. If someone said to you, you know, remember the arrangement, I'm going to repack and restack things. I bet you two years later, you'll have messed up. It does sound very smart, this whole process. So I wonder, how did we get there from like my primary school teaching when I used these lemons and created some energy? What happened in between those two methods? Well, first of all, I, I want to unpick the lemon again, because that is a mis <laughs> massive misnomer. So the lemon battery consists of a copper piece of wire and a zinc piece of wire. And it's the difference in the reactivity of the copper and zinc that's giving you the energy. The lemon is just a liquid with ions that allow, in this case, the protons to move backwards and forwards between them. So everyone thinks it's a magic lemon. The magic is in the two metals. So those were the sort of batteries that have been around for years and years and years, for centuries. And then it was a bunch of chemists over the years that came up with better materials to put together a rechargeable battery. And so you start off with the Baghdad batteries, very topical chemistry, but really moving into the chemistry of the Italians who came up with manganese dioxide. So the manganese that can be oxidized and reduced. And so you put that together with zinc and then you discharge that battery. The zincs go into solution. Actually, the protons go into the manganese oxide and eventually the zinc. And that gives you the so-called primary battery. The difficulty of that, you can only go one direction. It's very difficult to recharge it. And so what you needed to find was a structure where you could put ions in and you could also pull them out without changing the structure. And so the first or the best example of that came from Stan Whittingham, who took a sulfide, had layers of sulfur, titanium, sulfur, sulfur, titanium, sulfur, and he showed that you could put lithiums inside them. And the analogy I like to think about is that you've got sponge cake, so we have a lot of those in England, so you've got layers of cake, and you're trying to put the jam inside. And this goes back to your question, well, why do you, why do batteries fail? I mean, you can imagine if you're putting jam in, they're trying to get the jam out, and you're doing this multiple times, the cake crumbles. Well, the same thing happens in the batteries. The titaniums and the sulfur ions start to move, and so the process don't work so well. But anyway, Stan came up with titanium sulfide. He put it against lithium metal, and then he needed to find a liquid that didn't react with the lithium metal and it didn't react with the titanium sulfide. And he came up, and he and others, and it's, it's obviously a field with lots of different people, it's just easy to pick up a few names. Obviously, he was part of the Nobel Prize. Um, but the titanium sulfide process worked quite well, but it wasn't very high voltage. It was only about two volts. And the other problem was the lithium metal. 
So when you put lithium in, it goes from lithium metal to an iron. The iron goes inside the titanium sulfide. When you charge up in the other direction, you pull the lithium ions out. They go through the liquid, the equivalent of the lemon juice, but it's not water. It's an organic compound. And then it plates on the lithium metal. And instead of plating smoothly, it forms these mossy or dendritic structures. So these iron metal filaments come out. And if you do it for too long, the iron filaments can actually short circuit. So they can go from the lithium metal to the titanium sulfide. And then that metal bridge discharges your battery very fast. You get heating and you get fires. And so that original titanium sulfide battery was commercialized but it was pulled off very quickly because of these safety incidents. Meanwhile, John Goodenough in um, Oxford was looking at other oxides and he came up with the lithium cobalt oxide structure. And that's very similar to titanium sulfide, except now you've got layers of lithium, oxygen, cobalt, oxygen, lithium, and, and so on. So you've got the idea again of the cake sponge and the cake sponge is the cobalt oxide layers. And then you've got the lithiums inside and now you charge it, you pull the lithiums out and then at the same time, the groups in Japan were working on graphitic structures, so carbons, and eventually it became a graphite. So that's another layered compound. So you've got sheets of carbon and you can put the lithium ion safely inside. And that was the basis of today's modern lithium ion battery. And it's essentially looked like that for 25 years or more than that now, where you've got lithium cobalt oxide on one side and graphite on the other side, two layered compounds, lithium shuttling backwards and forwards, and that was why it was called a rocking chair battery, because it rocked, the lithium ions rocked backwards and forwards. Mm. So. so you were just talking about those dendrites, and these are like the most scariest things that I've heard of when it comes to batteries, because they look like hair. And then when they come from one side to the other, and they cause these, you know, the heat and maybe explosions and everything, that sounds pretty dramatic. Does that still happen? Because we all have those stories of everyday people getting a heart attack or something, an electric shock from touching their phone while it's charging. Is that what it is? No, I mean, I think dendrites, lithium dendrites are one of the possible safety stories. It's one that I happen to work on. If you look back at some of the early recalls of lithium ion batteries, they came from poor processing so the initial ones were done in poor automated with poor quality control. And at those points, people actually got iron filings that dropped into the batteries. And so when they, you put a battery in a can, so you can imagine, but it's on a slightly smaller scale, you roll out the component, you roll out the copper, then you roll out the cathode, which is a, the, the lithium cobalt oxide so, and some carbon. Then you put a separator, which is a bit like a piece of filter paper, and then you put the graphite on top, and then you put another... A layer is actually it goes aluminium next to the lithium cobalt oxide and copper next to the graphite technically and then you roll them up like you would a Swiss, a Swiss roll so this whole thing and then you shove it in a can so it's a bit like a, a can of coke except it's much smaller and then you have to seal the whole thing and that sealing process actually had problems and iron filings entered into the battery because of that and short circuited the battery and so you couldn't see it initially because they weren't actually in that short circuiting position, but the people are using them, they're moving them around, they're shaking them up and they moved. That was one cause. But the other dendrite story I was telling you about is something that still happens. Mm -hmm. So if you charge your battery too fast, instead of putting lithiums nicely into graphite, you form these little lithium filaments on the graphite. And that's why if you're designing an electric vehicle battery, you can't charge as fast as you want because you're worried about interpolating it, it safely. And so we design, I mean, we as the, the field design the batteries so that they're charged at a rate that you can hopefully ensure that there aren't that many dendrites. But actually, and I'm not recommending this to anyone, but were you to go into the lab and carefully pull your battery apart, the chances of finding lithium metal chunks is, is quite high. And that really? then feeds into the difficulties of recycling a battery. So as a society, if we're proposing to roll out and end the use of internal combustion engines, we're going to roll out electric vehicles. And in the UK, you know, that's by the end of the decade. So we're going to have this fleet of electric vehicles and we're going to have to recycle. But right now, taking the battery apart 
is a really problem in itself because you have to deal with a lot of the toxic components in there and then you've also got issues of these dendrites that are still sitting there. But surely there need to be um, regulations for this because, I mean, you were talking earlier about the fact that everything's charged ever so fast now. I mean, comparing how long it took my phone to be charged like five years ago or even ten years ago and how fast it charges now, there's a major increase of speed. However, I wonder if people now say even faster charging, is that the super speed charging that could be threatening? So should I be careful as a consumer when the advert says is the fastest charging battery ever? Well, I think that when you as a consumer are using your product, the product is spec to work within the safe regimes. They're not typically pushing everything to the limit. So mm. I, I would say that you shouldn't be worried. Now, that comes with the caution warning. And I think what you have to remember is, and this is something that's really interesting for scientists to think about, so a new phone comes out, and we could mention the companies that we all know about, but they sell a lot of phones. And then in the labs, they're having to test these batteries And they will pull out some batteries from the, 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 the production Charge. line and they will test them. They will ensure that those batteries have no faults. And each battery individually, what you do is you charge and discharge it, you check it's okay, and then you actually there's some decomposition reactions that go on and they gas and then you seal the battery and it all looks good, you check it doesn't die, and then it goes out into your phone. But to catch those few batteries with faults is a really difficult challenge. Because how do you find the one or two mm -hmm. in a million? And you can't test one or two in a million. But then going back to the sort of issue of fast charging, I think if you really want to fast charge, you've got to come up with different chemistries. You know, ultimately, you've got graphite, and it's limited by how fast you can get the lithiums into that structure. And so this is why we've been looking at new, um, in our case, niobium oxides, which are materials with bigger holes in them. And so the, the lithium ions can move in more rapidly into these things. So it's a bit like a sponge, basically. So you can sort of say, instead of a, a layered compound, now I've got a sponge and the, the lithiums absorb nicely into this material. And so that then allows you to do it more safely. We also operate at a slightly higher voltage. So that means in practice, you don't form lithium metal. And what's sort of interesting from the chemistry perspective is Materials don't stay static when you put lithiums in them. They can either expand or contract. It's a cool field, and I think we do need to think about applications where we inherently have to build in better safety. But it's a tension against, would you compromise your battery in terms of how long it lasts, in terms of how much energy, if you knew it was safer? And many of us would actually say, well, we'd rather have a phone that lasts for twice as long and use the, the best technology ever. But, but on the other hand, if you're trying to design a battery for grid storage, where it's going to be monstrous, and you also want to make sure it lasts for ages, then actually you may put safety as a very high criterion. And if in an electric vehicle, where it might be an accident, you really put safety as a really top priority. And when it comes to technology, we humans are always like we want to have the latest technology anyways and as the new phone is coming out next year why should the battery have to last forever which makes me wonder is there any difference in how i charge my phone should i always make sure the the battery is dead and then i recharge it i can see that you're laughing because I, i believe many people want to yeah i this. hate that question i just think <laughs> life's too short to worry about how i charge my phone i think the one thing is this whole myth about having to discharge it properly that is wrong that's based on old technology. So there was a chemistry called nickel metal hydrides where actually the structure depended on how you discharged it. And so if you discharge it all the way down, it would do something than if you partially discharged it. And, it, and that's called in science language a path hysteresis. So depending on how we go down the mountain, we go up the path in a different way. So you can imagine if you're walking downhill, if you only get to a certain point, then you can take that shortcut. But if you go down the bottom, then you can go in a different way. But for today's modern batteries, it doesn't matter if you fully discharge it. What does matter is if you hold it for a long time at fully charged and you put it on your lap and it's hot or you put it on the sun, the, the more charged the system, the more oxidized one side is, the more reduced the other side is, so the more likely it is to degrade. And the same thing, again, if you charge fast, you get heating, and that heating causes these degradation reactions. So the thing you have is you, your battery is operating at close to four volts. And I just I said this at the beginning of the program, 
the components are metastable. And so what metastable means is it's not their thermodynamic state. So they want to react to something else. But if you heat it up, whether you put it on your lap or you put it in the sun, that, that starts these processes of degradation. But I sort of feel like if you think too much about this, you never use your phone. And so I've, I've given up. You know, the people used to keep their batteries in the fridge just... You know, as I said, life is too short for that. So. Coming from chemical reactions to physics, there is something that I'm really curious about because it's the first time I got to know when I saw your science, which is just like us humans are put into magnetic resonance imagery to scan our body. You use nuclear, nuclear ma magnetic resonance. You can see I'm not familiar with that phrase. It's in short NMR to scan batteries. So how did anyone came up with that idea and why are you still using it? Well, and of course, you know, in hospitals, it's known as magnetic resonance imaging and the nuclear is dropped because to give the wrong impression that it's got anything to do with a nuclear reaction, which of course it doesn't. Yeah. So what the method does is it relies on the fact that a nucleus or some nuclei have a property of spin, which means that you put them in a magnetic field, they align. Mm -hmm. And so it's like if you have a compass, you have a north-south, and that aligns with the Earth's magnetic field. And we use the fact that if you think about a compass and you, you just imagine breaking it apart and flipping the north-south, there's a specific energy associated with flipping that north-south direction. And we use the fact that that specific energy tells us something about the local environments around the lithium ions. And so, you know, for me, it's a long story. I was doing this work as a PhD student. I got quite excited as a PhD student in developing a new method to look inside oxide materials and work out what the structures look like. And so as a scientist, and you think about how do we know things about structure? So how are the atoms arranged or ions arranged inside a solid piece of material? We always use this technique called X-ray diffraction. And that's been around for now more You know, a long time, actually developed in Cambridge, where I'm based, by the Braggs. And so well, they developed Braggs Law, and there was a lot of very strong German science, and Röntgen and the X-ray machine was one of the first to develop the cameras that made this possible. Anyway, you shine in X-rays, and, and I'm, I'm missing lots of the history, so apologize for those science buffs who are going to correct me on it. You come in with X-rays, you bounce the X-rays off the material, and because the materials are nicely ordered, you can get a series of peaks that tell you something about the structures of a material. Now that works very well if your material is ordered. And the term we would use in science is crystalline, so they're made up of nice crystals. But if it's messy and disordered, you can no longer do that. And so you need to find techniques that allow you to capture the environments even in a disordered material. And so this is what this NMR technique does. It allows you to look at the local environment. In my PhD, it was around tin atoms. And it was around rare earth atoms like yttrium, actually, and, and oxygen. And then it was when I was a professor in the US, where I was for a number of years, I started talking to battery scientists. I had a very um, good conversation with somebody in Duracell who was just starting to work on rechargeable batteries. And I also had colleagues in a nearby national lab who worked on these that I thought we could really use our NMR methods to look at the lithiums. And it, we're very lucky that lithium ions have spin, so they can be used. So there's two nuclei, lithium-6 and lithium-7, and they both have different properties and they're both very useful. And so I spent a lot of time trying to figure out how I could use the method. And then over the years, I've really developed this field, along with lots of other people. And you know, science is never done alone, but I've really made this a piece of what I do. I can really sense how much you're into science. And from our movie, I remember that you were saying you want to provide more for the following generations, because whatever is out there, you won't be able to, you know, do enough research within your own life. And, and I wonder, where does that come from, this passion for science? Yeah, it's a difficult question. I mean, first of all, I'm just very fascinated with unpicking puzzles and trying to understand how things work. You know, I always sort of joke that in some ways it's a bit like a Sudoku puzzle, except that this puzzle of mine, you keep at it for many years and we, we come up with a method and we, we have this chunk of material and we're trying to figure out what's inside it and how it's working with our method. And we only get so far because of the development of the particular technique. And then now I'm in my stage of my career when I'm coming back and I've actually got a better method and I go back to the same problems. But just that sort of sense of wanting to get to the bottom of something. And it's quite funny because if you think about 
a puzzle and you can't solve the puzzle, you go to the back of the magazine and, or you go to the place on the web and there are the answers. And of course, we can't do that. Mm -hmm. There isn't a sort of solution manual for us. So for that, that's always been a part of what I do. But I've also really wanted to try and couple my research with societal problems. And so for early parts of my career, I, I thought about doing medicine, but I I really was much more interested in physical sciences. And so that connection with environmental sciences started also quite early on. As a PhD student, I was interested in catalysis and so speeding up reactions, but from an environmental perspective. And then in my early career, I spent two years at DuPont, the chemical company. And that was the time of the Montreal Protocol. So getting rid of chlorofluorocarbons to help to close the gap in the ozone layer. And I started to think about how to use um, the methods we were using to try and improve the synthesis of hydrofluorocarbons, which at that time were the replacements for chlorofluorocarbons. Now, hydrofluorocarbons are actually now being phased out as well, but we were trying to think about how we could separate different mixtures of that. And then I got into environmental chemistry and, and how I could use my methods to look at how pollutants are absorbed on iron oxides and other minerals. And so I just have liked that connection through to the fundamental science to what that could impact the world. But I, I'm also quite passionate about articulating the need for not just the sort of development side. You know, it's not about applying the things in the world. It's also about doing that fundamental science to make the rest happen. And it's sort of easy to forget that, that if we're really going to solve the 2050 goals and climate change goals, there's a lot of real important fundamental science that's needed to be done now. It's not just about taking today's batteries and saying, oh, we can make electric vehicles or we can make grid scale batteries. You know, there are things that we don't know how to do. And it's people like me and it's people like the next generation who need to be doing it. And so making sure that there's enthusiasm and a recognition at the science level, at the students level, but also at the general populace, that it's not just about putting some mobile phone batteries together. There is really some fundamental science that needs to be done. And that requires that people learn how to, you know, they, they get their math skills. I mean, it's, good stuff, you know, it's a bit more tedious, but they, they learn their physics and their chemistry so that they can apply it to these really key problems in society. Well, I do understand the urge to find out the knowledge behind it or how it works. However, sometimes the application is just more practical and fascinating. And in terms of the climate change, I obviously would like to know your opinion on electric cars. So what is the application of your work there? Just to unpack that comment, I know I, I agree with you that the end is often a lot more interesting. And What's also interest, not interesting, but what's relevant for my work is that if you think about the end goal, then that often makes you think a little bit more differently about what you're doing yeah. in terms of the fundamental science. And that can often lead to different creative pathways. And so you can choose, in my field, there are people who look at what are called model compounds, so ones that display specific characteristics that allow you to test your method. And I've always mm -hmm. stayed away from that and said, no, I want to study the, the complex mess and that by looking at the complex mess, then that I can devise new ways of unpicking that. A, there's, it's made it's more interesting because you, you capture that complexity, but also you can see how it has real world applications more readily. Fair enough. To go back to your question about what do I feel about electric vehicles? Well, my personal feeling is that they are the best route forward we have at the moment in society to reducing CO2. I mean, mm -hmm. we have batteries that are not perfect, but they're good enough. And so we can make the electric vehicle revolution happen. But we've got lots of challenges if we really want to scale up. We need to make them cheaper. It's all very well from us in, in Germany, in the UK, to have an electric vehicle. Many of us can afford it, though not everybody can. Not everybody has the space for charging you live in dense populated areas how is that going to happen so there are a lot of challenges and there are a lot of mineral resource issues that we need to deal with if we're going to scale up and we need to think about how we get rid of the cobalt eventually probably the nickel and we can discuss whether we should even get rid of the lithium though i think some of that will be solved by if we can do the recycling so i view them as the short-term vector or method to get somewhere but next we need to think about what are we going to do about lorries and trucks Are we going to be able to get cheap enough batteries for that? Or are we going to have to redesign the whole freight system? Do we have the appetite as, as a country, as nations, to do that? Because it's not really that practical. Okay, there's some debate here, but to put your whole massive battery in a truck, 
But if you can think about short distribution networks and then long-term rail systems, then, then it all starts to be composable. So I, th- I think it's a fascinating debate that's going to happen in the next 10, 15 years. And I think we need to really connect the whole thing through from the fundamental science to what are the roadblocks to translating that? When do we need to make the decisions? You know, Are we going to do hydrogen? Are we going to do batteries? At what point do we have to actually say we're going to do this versus that? And what do we need to do now to enable those decisions to be made in the next five years? So I'm skirting around your answer, so, <laughs> but I feel like we have electric vehicles. They are part of the solution. And we have batteries that are good enough for at least generation one, two and three. But we've got mm-hmm. to keep on working to deal with sustainability issues and cost issues and safety and all the other things we talked about. And then there is another of many projects that you do, which is currently still in the lab, which is lithium air. And you need to explain to me what this is about. Does it mean that there is air in a battery and that actually increases its performance? And I think there's also hydrox something as well. So is it water as well? You asked me two seconds ago, are electric vehicles good enough? And I think the thing that you have to recognize is that we're very close to the fundamental limits and we've almost got as much energy as we can get out of today's batteries. Now we can figure out how to make them last longer and that's something I also do with my NMR and my other techniques is I try and sort of stop the degradation pathways and I think that's important because your battery, Mm -hmm. as you started to say, if it lasts two times longer, three times longer, that's good for sustainability. But as an academic, we also need to think outside the box and to make batteries that have much higher energy density. And if you think about what are the lightest elements that you could use, you know, it's lithium metal is certainly on the anode, and on the cathode, it's oxygen. So if you can make a battery where you just literally take lithium, lithium metal and oxygen together to form lithium peroxide, so Li2O2, that would be the ultimate battery. And that battery has an energy density of 10 times that of a normal battery, and it's comparable to petrol or gasoline. So energy density is you know, how much energy you can get out of it per unit of weight or volume, if you depending on your application. So yes, so that's that's the dream battery, and um, we've been working on it for a number of years. So a hearing aid battery is very related. So that's a combination of zinc and oxygen. And when you use the hearing aid battery, you rip a tab off, and that then lets the oxygen in. But with oxygen comes in water, it comes to CO2, and the reason you have it sealed is that they all react, and so you want to stop that. And so the same thing happens for lithium air, except lithium is more reactive than zinc. And so you form lithium carbonates, you form lithium hydroxides. And what we did was come up with a battery that formed lithium hydroxide, and then you can reversibly cycle with lithium hydroxide. And the feeling was that that's a more stable end product than lithium peroxide. So peroxide is is an oxygen that's got two extra electrons in it, but it's still got an oxygen-oxygen bond. So the sort of end reaction of an oxygen is to form O2- minus an oxide ion, and that's much more stable and that the hydroxide is an OH minus, so that's similar. So that's why, in principle, that's a good system. There are disadvantages of it. It's difficult to do it reversibly, and that's what we've been trying to get our heads around for the last six years now, sadly, to try and <laughs> actually go from that initial idea that we had and other people are pushing on sort of slightly different ways of doing things to actually making something that's commercial or even a prototype, let alone commercial. The problem that we're still struggling with is that As you cycle many times, you get lots of degradation reactions. And so the route from a hydroxide to oxygen are through radicals. And if you just think about what radicals do in your body, I mean, they're what's caused, they're, they're responsible for your aging. And we have exactly the same problems, except we're doing it backwards and forwards all the time. And so it's stopping those side reactions again. And so that's all working on. And as a scientist, we have to be trying to sort of push the next generation of batteries to get us out of the the limits that are imposed in today's technologies. Claire Gray has won the Kerber European Science Prize 2021. And I am certain that the prize money will be spent on more cool research. Speaking of cool, Claire Gray is also listed among the coolest UK female tech founders. Living proof that science is anything but boring. If you want to dive deeper, feel free to check the links in the show notes. One thing I take home from this conversation is the reminder that there is a lot more we need to worry about than how to charge your phone. Thank you very much for enlightening us, Claire Gray. Thank you very much. It's been lovely to talk to you. And you'll never think about that phone in the same way again. (laughs) Fair enough.